morning and welcome. We will uh, get underway this morning. If you want to uh, find your place to the text we'll be thinking about, uh, it was the last psalm, Psalm 150, which is on page, if I can find it. Psalm's easy to find. You just take the Bible and open it right in the middle, and uh, that's where it is. <clears throat> 583, thank you. I'm ripping pages apart trying to find my way there. As you know, we have been thinking about in this class the subject of worship, and we've been looking at a variety of uh, different points of interest in connection with that general theme. Uh, We started by just looking at the heart of worship, if I could put it that way, and Uh, We're right now in the midst of a conversation about what I'm calling in a very broad and sort of generic sense the ritual of worship. That is the external uh, behaviors, if I can use that sort of term, that are connected with worship. You know that especially as we gather together as the people of God in corporate worship, there is a kind of ritual to it. It can be very formal and well-defined, or it can be rather undefined and and, uh, casual, but either way, there is a kind of expectation, a kind of ritual to the whole thing, and that's good. It seems quite clear that God in his providence and direction to us, as revealed in the scriptures, has intended that we have this sort of ritual aspect to worship. But obviously, as soon as we say that, we open the door to some distortions and possible misunderstandings as to the way in which this ritual is supposed to affect us and the way in which we are supposed to approach it. And so that's what we're really thinking about here. In a, as I say, in kind of a broad sense, we're not thinking of any particular ritual now, anything like that, but just more the, the broad rubric, if I can put it that way, of, of uh, ritual and behavior and the external uh, expression of worship. Last week we were noting that we can make a fundamental distinction between two different ways in which this plays out in the life of worship, and I use the uh, at least preliminary distinction uh, organized around the terms word and sacrament. Uh, we in the Presbyterian tradition and most traditions have an understanding of those two. Now some are very much on one extreme or, and some are on the other. You can find churches that are virtually all sacrament, no word. You can find others that are all word, no sacrament, literally no sacraments, just the spoken word. But most Christian people in history have regarded both of these as essential to a full and proper experience of worship. There is the word which would stand primarily for the idea of rational discourse. We think the centerpiece of that is the sermon. And in my opinion, we had an extremely competent illustration of that with Kevin's sermon this morning. So I'm happy to be able to just refer you to that as a good example of the very thing I'm talking about. A sermon should confront us, should inform us, should educate, but also challenge. And all of those things are part of the sermonic aspect of the ritual of worship. Uh, There are other uh, areas where the word shows up. The Sunday school lesson, you see, is a word, but that's sort of on the the secondary status uh, and so on. At the same time, we have the sacrament. We think the primary sacrament would be the sacraments of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those would be sacrament in the narrow sense, but we also have a broader idea of sacrament, and in this sense we mean it more or less with a small s, you know, uh, more casual idea, but it would stand generally for the notion of, uh, I will put it this way, of touch, or even more uh, broadly construed, simply the idea of the experience, the sensory side of worship. What do we feel? What do we, what happens to us? which is not quite so much the cognitive, rational piece, but rather this that is more possibly emotive, uh, and so on. Now, I'm on on ground here that I'm not very comfortable with, to be honest with you. Uh, I tend to be really, you know, tilted in this kind of rational discourse area, so I'm I'm charting uh, 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 unexplored terrain uh, myself here a little bit, and, and this is one of those Sunday school lessons where... It's kind of like if you give me enough rope, I am going to hang myself this morning. So I just want to give you a heads up right off the bat that that I'm feeling some of the the pinch here a little bit. But I hope this conversation will be useful as we try to explore a little bit of this. Last week we were thinking particularly of the visual 
side of the experience of worship. God obviously has in mind that there is a visual aspect to this. The heavy emphasis throughout the scriptures on beauty, as we were noting last week, the first example of someone being filled with the Spirit ever recorded in the scriptures was so that they could produce beautiful artistry which would become part of the texture of the visual experience of worship. Uh, last week, Candy was sitting right behind Dorothy Fowler. And, uh, you know, it, it, we were thinking later, that's the perfect example. She is our modern Bezalel here at First Presbyterian who produces such wonderful art which helps us think about worship in remarkable ways. And there are many others, of course, in our congregation who have those kinds of gifts. Well, this morning I want to shift our focus just a little bit to the other senses. Uh, and thinking this morning not so much about the visual experience, but more of these other areas. And uh, so at this point I'm going to be taking a little bit of liberty, I guess, in the conversation. I hope you'll be tolerant with me if I seem to be off on the edges just a bit at this point, but hopefully this will be useful conversation for us. To frame our discussion, I'd like to refer you, however, to Psalm 150, uh, this wonderful sort of fireworks display uh, at the end of the Psalter, which really celebrates, in a sense, the sound of worship. And that's where I'd like to begin our conversation, the sounds of worship. So if you have the uh, place there, 583 is the page, uh, Psalm 150. This is the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the trumpet sound. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful for this exuberant exclamation of the style of the sound of worship. We pray that we would be those who would embrace from the heart, not just the sounds, but that inner disposition that says, in all of this, there is that sweet aroma that comes to you as an expression of our deep adoration for you as we express it in all of these varieties of ways. Bless our conversation this morning, we ask. We ask that our words and thoughts would be guided by your Spirit. To the honor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to be a little bit Socratic with you this morning. Um, just uh, You can answer aloud if you wish, or just uh, kind of think about it in your minds. But I want you to ask yourself, do a little uh, study in your head. Think about the church's... We'll just restrict it to America. This may be true around the world. I suspect it probably is, but we're most familiar with those churches that are part of our own culture and so on. So we'll think about American churches. Um, and ask yourself, how many churches do you suppose, what percentage, I'll put it that way, of churches uh, in the United States would have either the musical instrument called the piano or the organ or both, what percentage would you guess? I'm hearing everything above 90. 99? There are some that don't, but it would be much less than 1%. You know, so I think we're probably say we're probably about like the ivory soap number, 99 and 44, 100, something in that range would probably be the case. There are some traditions that actually object in principle to any musical instruments being a part of worship. They wouldn't have a piano, wouldn't have an organ, or any of the other musical instruments that you might conceive of. The only musical instrument permissible would be the human voice. And, you know, frankly, those people many times know how to sing. They, are, they make beautiful music. But that would be by far the radical mi minority. That uh, basically, uh, we would uh, agree that, uh, you know, the uh, vast majority of churches. Now, let me ask you this. Would have the piano or the organ? 
Well, let me ask you this. Why do you suppose it's the piano and the organ that have become such popular uh, instruments in worship? Any thoughts about that? I know I don't usually do this, but I'm just curious. Any thoughts? Why do you think the organ or the piano have become the uh, instruments du jour for the uh, life of worship? Excuse me? Most songs are written expecting that. That's very likely the case. Yeah, Tony? A broad range of sound, very versatile. Um, it, it's, it's actually fairly recent history, uh, recent in the sense of the last you know, few centuries. Uh, we, we, when we say recent historically, that's usually more than uh, two or three lifetimes. But, but the organ has become so popular. And part of the reason the organ has become popular, and, and to a lesser extent the piano, but certainly the organ especially, is because it was the original synthesizer as Tony was just suggesting. Uh, if we could go on a little field trip to our wonderful organ over here, uh, and if I knew what I was doing, I could pop it open and show you all of the musical instruments that are contained in that wonderful device. You can produce a trumpet. You can produce violins. You can produce the lute, the harp, the cymbals, percussion, the whole bunch of musical instruments are somehow found in the organ, you know. Interestingly, there are some... Now, I don't know if you've ever, ever met anyone like this. I have. In fact, let me ask you the question. Have you ever met anybody who, on principle, said the only musical instrument that you should have in church is the organ? You ever met anyone like that? I Okay, we can see a couple of hands. Yeah. And the rest of you are just shy, but... Um, I, you know, and I'm not saying that's a majority of Christians out there that have that opinion, but there are certainly some who would say that the only musical instrument that you should find in church is the pipe organ. It is the only holy instrument. And isn't it ironic that the reason that the pipe organ became so popular was precisely because it could emulate or simulate all those other instruments and it was considered too expensive, too logistically challenging to have all those other instruments, so let's settle for the organ. You know, and now, many years later, we think, well, it's the only, only the organ is the one that should be there in church. Not that that's the opinion necessarily you know, current uh, with a lot of Christians, but certainly there has been that attitude. How important... Now, here's a question. You don't need to answer this out loud. It's a rhetorical question. How important do you think music is to the experience of worship? I have met people who have told me, just candidly, they go to church for the music. And they pick their church for the music. They uh, I like it if there's a good sermon, as long as it's not too long. Um... Don't have much time for a Sunday school lesson. The uh, sacraments are fine. It's okay. But the music, the music is what's important. And they actually pick the context of worship based on music. I, I think most of us would agree, whether or not that's you, whether or not music is that important to you, I think all of us can take notice of the fact that it is extraordinarily important that people place an extremely high premium on the question of music. And indeed, when we've talked in recent weeks about the so-called worship wars, in many ways, probably the principal driving energy behind these so-called worship wars has been music, hasn't it? It usually isn't disputes over the, the sermon. It is, isn't. Or the way the sacrament is celebrated. It is music. And so, you know, I, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised. It's very important... And then by the very nature of the case, it becomes controversial. Because different people like different kinds of music. It's that simple. We have different tastes in music. And we kind of like to go to church and have our taste complemented by whatever happens there. Well, I have had people say to me, you know, it's just a matter of taste. Any kind of music is fine. It doesn't really matter. Because actually the only difference between one kind of music and another is just personal preference. Now, we can entertain that naive thought 
for purposes of a simple conversation. But let me tell you something. The folks in Hollywood who are making millions of dollars peddling entertainments to the uh, American culture know better. The people who are making astronomical fortunes know better. They know it is not a matter of taste. They know that different kinds of music communicate different messages. And they use it with a high degree of sophistication in order to extract money from you in the form of movies and other entertainments. They know that they can, by certain harmonic relationships and rhythms that you may not even notice as you're watching a movie, make you cry. It may be a B-movie, lousy acting, thin plot, but if they can put the right soundtrack under it, you'll have tears running down your face. You know that's true, don't you? And you're not even quite sure why. It's the music. Because music can reach you. And many times, as I say, it's subliminal. We don't even know what's happening. It's just kind of under the surface. Music can make you feel apprehensive. Music can make you terrified. Music can make you lighthearted. Music can make you feel sad. can make you feel sort of carefree. Music can do all of these things, and it is not a matter simply of personal preference. So if you have that in your mind, just recognize the folks that spend their lives studying this know better. And we would be wise to know better as Christian people. It is more than just personal taste, you know. Well, we have this idea that uh, music has this kind of importance. And we know that music can create atmosphere. If a uh, movie maker wants to create, for example, the impression of a dark and stormy night. The music underneath the scene of a dark and stormy night is not going to be Raindrops keep falling on my head. You know? The movie maker knows that's not going to get that impression over in a way that is going to create the atmosphere that is the, uh, the, the, that's the intended experience. You know? It's two different feelings. I don't know how you feel about Gregorian chant. There was a time in my life when I really disliked it. Now, I'm not going to advocate that we start sending, singing Gregorian chant every Sunday, so just relax. But um, back when I was at Whitworth a hundred years ago, I actually, for one semester, was a music major. And, uh, of course, one of the first things you take in music majoring is uh, music theory. And one of the first exercises I had to do, which I think may have cured me of being a music major, was I was required by the professor in that course to write Gregorian chant. And it was a sort of an exercise, a discipline. And, I, and now I think about it, I realize it was probably a very good thing. But then I was, I was immature and didn't really see the point and... Uh, but I, I remember at the time I didn't like Gregorian chant very much. And I think part of the reason I didn't like it was because I associated Gregorian chant with the Catholic Church. And I was a hardcore Baptist, and I knew you couldn't be a Catholic and be saved. And because Gregorian chant was part of the Catholic tradition, I think that was part of the, part of the attachment that made me react negatively to it, you know. As I've mellowed over the years... I've actually come, I have to admit to you, to appreciate and kind of like Gregorian chant. Not that I listen to it day in and day out by any means, but, you know, if, if you're familiar with that style of music, you know that it sort of is the music that goes with those cathedrals that we were talking about last week, the visual experience of great Gothic cathedrals with wide open space and a sense of the otherness of God. Somehow the collateral music that seems to fit in there is the Gregorian chant. You know. In fact, when I hear Gregorian chant and close my eyes, what it sort of conjures up within me is a feeling of haunting, mysterious transcendence. And I have to say to you honestly that when I come to church, part of what being in worship is about, at least it seems to me, should be reminding ourselves of the transcendence and the mystery of God. I grew up, as I mentioned a minute ago, in a Baptist uh, tradition. 
although I don't think this is a uniquely Baptist uh, situation I'm about to describe. But, you know, we, uh, especially in youth group, would sing fun songs. And there were just tons of them. We loved to sing them. Some of you will recognize, for example, this old standard. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. <clears throat> I've got the wonderful love of my brother Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Way down in the depths of my heart. Way down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my brother Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Way down in the depths of my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. <laughs> Amen. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> I thought you were say, don't quit your day job. That was a, you, know. <laughs> you know what? That song is fun to sing. I liked singing it as a kid. I even enjoy singing it as a 55-year-old. But it does not provoke a sense of haunting, transcendent mystery. Does it? You know? It is simply not part of its content. And we should be asking ourselves the question, as those who are involved in worship, and I'm not trying to say, you know, that that's the, we're going to choose between Gregorian chant and joy in the heart. Kind of, it's not so simple as that. But to at least be aware that there is a legitimate question to be asked. What is this music communicating? What is the message that's part of the content? Because the very fact that we can attach music to words can have a huge effect on its meaning. I've been married for about uh, 20, coming up on 21 years of married bliss. And I've spent many hours, happy hours, with my wonderful and lovely wife, Candy. And um, I think I could probably say to you, after these many years together, I could sort of observe as just a fact that I've grown accustomed to her face. You know. Um, or I could say to you, I've grown accustomed to her face. Now, was there any difference? Not that I can do any justice to that song. You understand, John Frankhauser is not at risk for his job. <laughs> you know, uh, because the new bass is coming on the scene. But is there any difference between those two? Do you see the same words have this remarkable ability to be transformed just by the addition of something like a little bit of music. How is it that we can change the texture of words and their meaning somehow alters with it? One of the struggles that we've been uh, involved in as Christian people, not just in this church or any particular church, but really throughout the history of this whole question, there has been this ongoing um, struggle as to the extent to which we should be marrying the, ch the music in the church with the music in the culture. And there have always been people, and this is not uniquely 20th or 21st century, this has been going on clear back, you can find traces of this clear back in the 2nd and 3rd century, uh, virtually every century, this struggle has been to some degree on the radar screen. To what degree are we going to try to accommodate the music in the church to make it more appealing to that which is fashionable in the culture? That's always a debate. One of the most beloved hymn writers of the late 1800s, she literally turned out hundreds of hymns. She is one of the most beloved hymn writers to... You know, just hardcore, conservative, fundamentalist, evangelical, Bible Belt Christians T today and for the last many years. This person's name has been almost synonymous with mainstream Christian music. What is her name? Fanny J. Crosby. You know, 
uh, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, and so on. It was all these wonderful kind of upbeat, lilt, you know, words that, that just gave you a kind of uh, energy and so on. I don't know if you realize this, some of you I'm sure do, that Fanny J. Crosby in her day was a highly controversial character. There were many people who thought she was a great threat to the church. Many people loved her, but many people really regarded her as a pernicious evil. And I mean, there was writing and you know, publications and so on about Fanny J. Crosby. Because what she was doing, consciously, quite aware of what she was doing, was writing Christian lyrics and co-opting the honky-tonk music of the day. Music that was sung in the bars and saloons with raunchy words. She was taking that music, bringing it over, attaching a new vocabulary to it, and peddling it to the church of her day. And some Christians thought it was wonderful, and some thought it was absolutely horrifying. But now, 50 years later, 60 years later, we have people that would die for the sanctity and the holiness of Fanny J. Crosby's music. You see how that kind of... Isn't that an interesting thing that that uh, would happen? I bought some software uh, fairly, well, maybe two or three years ago. And it's music software. That is, it's uh, kind of what they call jukebox software. It's supposed to organize your, your CDs and that kind of thing, you know. And uh, what you do is you put your music on a, on a computer and then you can uh, arrange it. That is, you can organize it by various, you know, criteria. And one of the criterion is simply the, the very simple thing, what kind of music is this? And there would be one of those neat little drop-down lists, you know, that you have, uh, and you can do the drop-down list and pick. So you've got choices like pop, uh, classical, jazz. I was very interested to see whether one of the options there would be Christian. We had that made, you know, the list here. This is just secular uh, the product, and not, not a Christian uh, manufacturer. And I was very happy to see that Christian was one of the options. But there was another word with Christian. Christian rap. That was the only Christian option there. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody, so if this... If this is disturbing to you, then please forgive me. But I can't stand rap. I can't stand it. And when somebody puts the word Christian and rap in the same phrase, I want to throw up. I mean, if there's ever been an oxymoron, that's it. I cannot abide. The proposition that you could have Christian rap, but do you know what? I'm willing to wager. I won't live to see this, so I'm pretty safe, but you can at least think of it what it's worth. I bet in 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, there will be people who will be celebrating the great, wonderful rap music that we, are, that we have in the church. And it will be then what Fanny J. Crosby is in some people's minds today. Because that happens in the history of church. And I'm not saying any of this to be disparaging. I'm not trying to take some sort of critical attitude. Because honestly, I believe there is a place for you know, laboring to do those kinds of things. All I want to leave you with in this very short uh, conversation about music, I'm not even pretending to give you some sort of definitive resolution of an extraordinarily complex and thorny issue. I just want to leave you with a couple of questions. And I think these questions are peculiarly important for the people of God generally and especially for those in leadership positions who are responsible to deal with how we do worship. A couple of questions that I think need to be raised with respect to music. Given the fact that not all music communicates the same thing and given the fact that it is not simply a matter of taste, we need to ask the question... What message are we trying to communicate with our music? And that is not a question just for musicians. That's not, in fact, strictly speaking, a question of music at all. It's a much broader question of the ministry of the church. What message are we attempting to communicate with our music? And then, and only then, can we ask the second question... 
the follow-up question, which is for the musicians, what music accomplishes that purpose? My opinion is, for whatever it's worth, may not be worth much, but my opinion is that we've gotten the cart before the horse repeatedly. And we've asked the question, what music do we want to hear? What music do the people want to hear? What, what's really, you know, just getting people revved up these days? And that's an easy question to answer. But it may be a completely irrelevant question in terms of the broader issue of the ministry of the church. So my appeal to all of us is that we have the maturity and the distance on the topic to ask the first question first. What are we actually trying to communicate? Are we trying to communicate a dark and stormy night? Or raindrops keep falling on my head? Are we trying to just communicate joy, joy, joy? What are we trying to communicate here? And then, having answered that question to the satisfaction of those who have the maturity to answer such questions, you know, and I'm I'm saying that's all of us, Then we can say, okay, now, in terms of the sermon, in terms of the music, in terms of the architecture, in terms of all that we do, what is the best way to get that message over? All right. Uh, Another of the senses that, uh, of course, we think of, and you think music is bad, wait till I mention this one. How about the sense of smell? Now, at this point, we Protestants have just completely missed it. We have utterly missed it. We don't even go there. Uh, But uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition, as you're well aware, and in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, two major branches of the Christian uh, um, uh, presence on this planet, you know, representing millions and millions of Christian people, they do go there in ways that don't even cross our minds in terms of the aroma of worship. We have, of course, reacted to some degree out of our Protestant tradition, our protesting tradition. We have protested a lot in the Roman Catholic uh, heritage that maybe was an overreaction. In other words, we've not only thrown out the baby, but the math water and the whole bathroom and the rest of the house. And we've just gone elsewhere. And so we've thrown out a lot of what, for many Christian people, has been a deeply and meaning, uh, significantly meaningful aspect of the experience of worship. You see, and that is the aroma of it. Uh, and that's not unprecedented biblically. I think you're aware that as we survey the scriptures, God Himself will frequently describe His pleasure in the worship brought to Him by His people as a sweet smelling incense or aroma. And that is just part of the texture of the scriptures. I think sometimes we hardcore Protestants just read by that and somehow our eyes glaze over. We don't even quite get it. But that is part of the very deep sense of what's happening. And that's Old and New Testament. This is not something uniquely. Old. In fact, listen to these words, the first few words of uh, Revelation chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. To him was given much incense to offer on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. And the text goes on. And that's just tucked in there, and it's not the only place in Revelation or elsewhere where we find this casual allusion to the aroma of worship, to the deity. And as as it were, as an echo of that, God has ordained, at least in biblical worship, that there's an aroma of worship for humanity. I don't know if you caught it in the news, I imagine you did, two weeks ago, two researchers got split the Nobel Prize because of the work that they've done, the research they've done with respect to the olfactory sense. Um, And it's been determined that we humans uh, have the ability to distinguish literally thousands of different aromas. And have you ever noticed how an aroma can just take you somewhere dramatically? Ever had that experience? I know you have. Every one of you in this room has had the experience of unexpectedly smelling something. And it'll take you back somewhere years ago as if you were there in a a way more powerful, more dramatic than if you even saw something or heard something. The aroma just takes you there. 
Every time I smell burning leaves, I am transported back to my boyhood in Grand Coulee and spring cleaning. I love that smell. We don't have it anymore because we have burning bands, you know. But on those rare occasions when I smell burning leaves, I'm just there. Thirteen years old. You have that experience? God realizes we are... He created us that way. And you see, it was his intent that there be some distinctive aroma for the Jewish people connected with worship. In fact, it was illegal in Israel to burn the incense that was used at the temple anywhere else except the temple. It was illegal. He wanted a unique aroma to accompany the time of worship. He wanted all of our senses to somehow be engaged in this. What the eye sees, what the ear hears, what the nose smells, all of this taking over, as it were, the human person and transporting us into different space where we think about this great God that we worship. We have sort of denuded Worship in many ways, and obviously I'm not saying we like we First Presbyterians. I mean, this whole tradition that we have, the Protestant tradition, I'm being critical at this point, um, admittedly. I think we've lost something there. Now, what do we do? I, uh, if, you were, if you've been in this church for a few years, you know that sometime back we actually experimented in using incense in a worship service. How many were here? Are there anybody? I see a few tentative hands, yeah. I think we could probably describe how that went that Sunday. I don't know. The word I would use is something like catastrophe, you know. <laughs> probably. Uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't work. I, I'm, I'm willing to grant. We really messed up. And it was just, the fire marshal, I think, was about to show up. It was just, but all that means is we're just not good at it. <laughs> you know, we, we need some practice. Uh, and maybe that wasn't quite the way to try to, you know, get ourselves uh, moving down that track. I, I'm perfectly willing to allow that. I heard someone suggest once, and I'm not proposing this. This is not a motion I'm going to bring to the session. So, you know, if, if you're uncomfortable with what I'm saying here, don't panic. But, uh, you know, I, I heard someone suggest once, something that struck me as kind of appealing. Maybe every sanctuary should have, I'm just pipe dreaming, okay? Maybe every sanctuary should have, right at the back, in a little corner, out of the way, a little, let's say, fireplace, you know, or like a little Franklin stove or something like that, depending on the decor of the place. And maybe there should just always be a little flame going there with, with a very mild and pleasant aroma that's distinctive. And maybe we should just have an expectation that people, when they come to worship, are free to write little personal prayer requests, something they don't want to share necessarily publicly, but something that's on their hearts. And they can just write that down and, and at the end of the service or any time, any time of the week. They could come in and just toss that little thing into the fire, you know. Now, I realize if we actually propose that here, there'd be all kinds of questions, and rightly so, and I, uh, that, that is a conversation that should take place. But I'm willing to wager that if a church were to do that, after it had been in place for a few years, then if somebody proposed that they stop, there'd be even more questions. Because I think there's a likelihood that people would become very attached to that sort of sacramental aspect to the life of worship. There's this place that has a unique sense, sight, aroma, a place of kind of touching the presence of God. We understand God is everywhere. We understand that. But God has made us with that capacity to have special space and to attach to its significant meaning. Just a thought. Uh, how about the taste? How about the taste of worship? We hear in the Old Testament that we should taste and see that the Lord is good. The idea that there is a taste to the experience of worship is really taken for granted in the Bible. Uh, part, I mentioned, I think, last week or maybe the week before last, the fact that in the Passover celebration in the uh, Old Testament, there were a variety of foods that were eaten. Not all of them were pleasant to the taste. Uh, probably the most uh, uh, dramatic one was called the bitter herb. I've tasted the bitter herb that was used. It's bitter. It doesn't taste good, you know. I wouldn't want it for a steady diet. But uh, nevertheless, part of that Passover observance would be to eat the bitter herb. And a child would wrinkle his nose and go, I don't like this. 
And the parent would say, that's good. That's good that you don't like it. Let me tell you why. Because it reminds you and reminds me that there was a time when we were all in bondage. In a bitter kind of slavery. And that God has wonderfully, graciously liberated us from that. And we eat this bitter herb to bring it back in our minds that there was that time when we were under bondage. Now, maybe we weren't slaves in Egypt, but we were all slaves to sin at one point, And that's a more bitter bondage yet. And to say that God has liberated us from that by the taste. In the New Testament, obviously, what we think of usually with the uh, idea of taste, we think of the sacraments. And at the, again, at this point, I'm going to get myself in a little more trouble. I don't know how much trouble I'm in so far, but uh, just you know, I guess I'll just keep slogging along here. But the taste of the sacrament. Christ ordained the use of unleavened bread and fermented wine. That is the fact. Now, we tend in our worship, for a variety of reasons, to use neither. Uh, we, we, uh, we, do, we many times won't use unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is like a cracker. It's dry, not very tasty, not what we first choose. It's almost like the bitter herb, you see. It's supposed to remind us of the significance of the atonement and the dry, fractured reality of what sin had done to us and the fact that Christ's body had to be broken for the state of sin in which we had found ourselves, you see. Uh, wine was used in the Passover, and Jesus celebrated the first so-called Lord's Supper. It was the last Passover. That's the linchpin between old and new. So what we call the, you know, the communion, the Eucharist, was that Passover celebration. And he held up that wine. It wasn't Welch's grape juice, friends. It was wine. And he said, this is my body broken for you. John Calvin, the beloved the sort of spiritual founder of the Presbyterian Church, goes into extraordinary detail on why wine is such an appropriate element to use in the communion. Its red color bespeaks the shed blood of Christ. It's produced by the crushing of grapes as, bo- as Christ's body was crushed. Its alcoholic content provokes a kind of sensation that can be when it just hits your palate for the first moment, a kind of burning. Because there's a burning aspect, you see, to the work of Christ and the redemption that he won for us. And yet wine, we're told biblically, is that which makes the heart glad. To the Hebrew, while drunkenness was repudiated and rejected and viewed as a sin, nevertheless, that little sense of well-being that comes by wine is actually part of the biblical message about it. Uh, I realize to say that some people object just you know, strenuously uh, to the use of fermented uh, wine in the communion. They say, well, what about alcoholics and all of this? And I say, okay, fine. We, that's a fine debate to have. But all, my, all I'm saying here is before we start tinkering with that which Christ has ordained, we should proceed cautiously. I know many churches that offer both. I know some churches that for a person who simply doesn't want to drink fermented wine, they'll cross themselves, you know, both in Protestant and Catholic traditions. Or they'll have an option of grape juice there if they're they're preferring it. Again, I'm not bringing this to session, you understand? I'm I'm not advocating any big changes. I'm just saying we should be thinking about this because God has in part intended worship to reach the whole person. And we are at least in part creatures that taste. And God has accommodated himself to the taste as well as these other things. What about touch? We see throughout the scriptures and throughout the history of the church the very significant importance of the touch. The laying on of hands. In the New Testament, that was a standard procedure. In the Old Testament, it was a standard procedure. The people would be ordained into various capacities and responsibilities in part by the laying on of hands. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, intended to produce miraculous results. Usually not. Usually it was simply a way of, through a tactile kind of moment, communicating something to us through touch of the presence of Christ. It is significant to us human beings that we be touched. Touch is a deeply, profoundly important part of the human contact with Life around us. I, 
Well, you know, again, if you don't mind me just being personal to a fault this morning, but uh, I remember the installation service that we had for Woody when he came uh, some eight years ago. And uh, if you were here, you may recall that there were several pastors that joined in this uh, installation celebration. At the end of the service, uh, those who wished to could come forward and kneel, and various pastors would come and put their hands on the heads of the folks that had come forward and, and just pronounce a blessing, you know. And uh, I remember it very well. I remember like it was yesterday. I, I was one of those that came up and knelt down, and the individual, the pastor that put his hand on my head, happened to be from uh, St. John's, St. John's Cathedral. I never met the man. Uh, he put his hand on my head, pronounced a blessing, and I tell you, I thought electricity was going through me. It was so deep, I was completely unprepared for that moment of touch. It, it changed me. And it surprised me because that's not my basic... I'm not one of those touchy-feely people, you know. I, am, I tend to be disparaging of such people, and all of a sudden I am one. You know. And that just electrified me, it really did. In the very early church, uh, back in the second, third centuries, um, as you know, Christian communities generally met in small uh, places, houses, house church were, churches were common. So the congregations were necessarily small. It's because Christianity was the religio illicita, that is, the illegal religion. And it was a common practice, we know from uh, commentators on the church at the time, Justin Martyr and others, who describe what would happen in a, in a typical church service, and they would say that at the end of the service, one of the things that would happen is the pastor would put his hands on an individual person. I'm just going to, for experimental purposes, do you mind, Laurie? If I do this, they would at the end of the service put their hands on a person and they would pronounce the great Hebrew benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Okay. Thank you. And then they go to the next one. Every person in worship was blessed individually by touch and word. Now there came a time when as too many people came to church, it became impractical. It took longer to do the blessing than it took to have the rest of the service. And so what happened was over time, the change in the format shifted from touching an individual to raising the hands to symbolize the touch. And to this day, the reason pastors raise their hands and say the Lord bless you and keep you and so on is to reflect a kind of practical adjustment that began way back then with the actual touch. Now again, I'm not proposing that we go back to that, but you know, what would it mean to you sometimes to have that blessing pronounced? What would it mean to me occasionally to be touched? And to hear that blessing. Again, we tend to be a little bit sterile, you know, in our, especially Protestant tradition. We are a little bit, what they called in the very early church, Gnostic. A little platonic. It's the life of the mind, but not the life of the body. And when you read the scriptures, you find out that God is profoundly concerned with both. And that worship really does have a deep and profound way of contacting us in the whole of what we are. So that's it for that little piece of our conversation. We're going to be moving uh, in the next several weeks really to a focus, especially on the sacraments. And uh, those would be, of course, the core of the sense in which we have touch in the life of worship, and we'll be uh, looking at those in more detail. But uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're grateful that you are a God who reaches us in the totality of what we are. The sounds, the smells, the taste, the touch, the sights of worship, all mingling together with the preached word to engage all that we are and to bring us in some way into your presence and to give us in some 
distant way a glimpse of heaven. We're grateful for it. We pray that we would be students of these matters and would ask ourselves ever more acutely how it is that we can, as your people, be responsible as we seek to communicate the gospel in ways that are biblically faithful, honoring to Christ, and actually do reach the hearts and minds and souls of men and women who desperately need you. We give you thanks for it in the name of Christ. Amen.